Hello, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for WCM's monthly webinar. I'm your host, Becky D, and I'm joined here, uh, as always, by producer Ben, who's making it all happen on the tech side for us. Uh, and we are doing a really special webinar today, and I'm very excited to introduce you to our special guests. Uh, last month, we did a little bit of Cultivation 101, and we went up through the process of, of taking clones and, and getting them rooted. Uh, today, we're going to take you from that point all the way through harvest, trimming, curing, drying, all of that good stuff. And we are joined by WCM's expert cultivators. Uh, we have Sean A. Bear, Director of Production Operations with us. And si by his side is Ian Andrews, who is our cultivation manager. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Becky. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate you guys taking some time. Um, you together have decades of experience in cultivating not just cannabis, but all sorts of plants. So, um, Sean, I want to start with you. Can you tell us just a little bit of your background? Sure. I uh, actually got into commercial growing about eight years ago, not with cannabis, but with uh, hydroponic tomatoes at Backyard Farms up in uh, Madison, Maine. Um, huge facility, 42 acres, about 300,000 plants, produced about 27 million pounds of tomatoes uh, annually. Um, I worked my way up from uh, actual crop care worker and picker and packer to team lead, and then ultimately about uh, six years in, was promoted uh, to director of cultivation for the entire facility. Uh, shortly after that, uh, I got a lead for uh, this job here at the Wellness Connection and uh, through an actual old colleague of mine and I uh, was very excited to uh, take on the challenge of uh, producing high quality medical cannabis right here in Auburn. Well, we were super glad to have you join the team and uh, and help us keep keep quality high and the plants healthy and, and the medicine of, of good quality. Um, so thank you for that, Sean. Uh, Ian, talk to us about, about uh, your background. How'd you end up here? Sure. Um, I actually, as it turns out, I have a uh, business degree, mm -hmm. but I started here with Wellness Connection back in the summer or late spring of 2012 as a cultivation assistant, where I kind of learned the ropes. Um, I quickly learned, learned and, and moved up to uh, cultivation team lead and then ultimately became the cultivation manager, just recently became the cultivation operations manager. I need to get back in and change my title slide then. <laughs> Congratulations on that. <laughs> so um, tons of experience here, um, and, and uh, we're, again, we're really uh, thrilled to have you both take some time out of your day and, and join us. Uh, you know, the spring weather is, is upon us, and uh, I know folks are are getting excited about you know putting their gardens in and, and maybe doing a little indoor gardening as well and I do want to uh, point out that we're going to be talking a lot about indoor cultivation but if you have questions if you're planning to grow outside uh, feel free to throw those questions out because between these guys we'll, we'll figure out an answer for you. Um, so let's just dive right in here. Um, I want to start by framing this um, by, by framing out Maine's law. Uh, under Maine's medical cannabis program, patients are allowed to grow their own plants, and that is um, not true in many medical marijuana states, so we're, we're pretty fortunate that, that we have that freedom here in Maine. Uh, qualifying patients can cultivate or designate a cultivator um, to grow up to a total of six mature marijuana plants, um, and then you can have a uh, product that's in various stages of processing. You can have um, pretty much unlimited seedlings and, and younger plants, but once they start to flower, um, you know, it's, it, you got to narrow it down to your six healthiest and, and, and stick with them. Uh, one thing that is not on this slide that everybody should be aware of, uh, growing in Maine has to take place in an enclosed locked space. Um, and that, that is whether, you know, it's a facility like we're sitting in um, with, you know, heavy-duty security, et cetera, or if you're growing in your backyard. You have to have a fence around it, um, a, a gate with some sort of a locking device, and that's, that's just good, good common sense uh, to, to keep your grow, um, you know, out of, uh, well, it, Everybody doesn't need to know <laughs> um, that you're that you're growing, and those fences help with that. All right. So I'm gonna hold on. We're having a little bit of a tech 
bubble here. And need to fix that. There we go. Um, so, gentlemen, uh, we we went over this in the in the last um, webinar, uh, and I just want to get your take on on this timeline. Do you think we are, we are accurate, and and what kinds of things can affect a timeline like this? Um, weather, maybe, or different strains. Uh, talk to me about the time investment that somebody's going to need to expend. I would say that um, the, the timeline is quite accurate. It is going to be very um, strain dependent, however. Um, when you're looking at, I mean, from germinating seeds and taking clones um, all the way through veg, it's pretty consistent. The flowering is where you get some variation. Um, typically, your indicas are your faster flowering varieties. Mm -hmm. Uh, it takes roughly 45 to 60 days to reach full maturity, whereas your sativas typically take longer, and they don't usually reach full maturity until roughly 60 to 90 days. For instance, um, strains that people are quite often familiar with, and especially if they are patients here with WCM, something like Kush um, is roughly a 53-day flower, 53 to 60 days. Um, something like Chocolope are on that sativa end is more like a 63 to 70 day flower. Wow. So, so if you're if you're planning to grow your own, um, it's a time commitment. Are, are there more and less uh, time intensive uh, phases of of growing? Like, if I put some in and I know that I'm going to be on vacation for two weeks, um, you know, is that going to be a problem, or or what would you guys say say about that, Sean? You're <laughs> you're smiling. Well, I would say that uh, just like any type of farming, you know, your commitment to the crop is uh, is pretty. Uh, pretty tight. I mean, you, you have to uh, be able to complete certain tasks uh, and be available for for your crop. Um, just like milking the cows, you know, the plants have to be pruned at a certain time. And if you if you miss that, those certain things that have to occur when they're supposed to occur, um, that could put the plant at risk and also put your, your work, uh, it could compromise your whole work plan. Yeah. Um, I did notice on this timeline too, uh, some of the it says harvesting and drying three to ten days. I would say somewhere in the middle, like seven days, is probably a good number for for drying. Um, we obviously we flush with, with clear water uh, prior to harvest, and then we cut irrigation off completely uh, a week before to take some of the moisture out of the plant, mm. and then that way it's not carrying so much water into the drying room. Um, so they're already on their way to drying before they even leave the pot. And that doesn't stress them? That's, that's not no, bad that's for them? that's standard operating procedure, and uh, it doesn't really seem to have much of a negative effect at all. Uh, curing, I would, again, I would say, uh, you know, it's more likely uh, one to two weeks, primarily because, you know, we've got such a demand uh, for our product that, uh, you know, we do have to con condense some of the curing stages a little bit, depending on the popularity of the strain. Um, but really to no ill effects, uh, you know, some of the le less popular strains might uh, stay in their curing bags a little bit longer uh, before they get trimmed versus, you know, something super popular like MOB that, uh, you know, we need to get on the shelves as quickly as possible. So okay. there's a little bit of, of leeway or play in that, in that number as well. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if you guys uh, are listening and you have questions, again, just use that little chat bubble uh, that you're seeing at the top of your screen, and you can send those along, and, and Producer Ben will catch those for us and, and pass them along to us. So, Can um, I just, uh, when you go to the next slide? Yeah, I'm on the next slide. With yeah. birth through semen. I just want to say something that might be very uh, uh, simple and rudimentary to some of you folks that are more experienced with uh, cannabis cultivation. But uh, when I first came here, and, and a lot of my visitors, they don't understand the nature of uh, marijuana and its photosensitivity. Mm. Um, a lot of folks don't realize how growers manipulate light and light spectrums to induce flowering. Um, I had no idea, and, and a lot of other folks out there don't know that as well. So if there's anybody out there on the line that, that doesn't understand, you know, we, we basically... Uh, convince the plants that it's a certain time of year. While it's in veg stage, the light and the light cycle, the length of duration of light 
to 12 hours of light tricks the plants into thinking it's a warm summer day when they're supposed to be bulking up and add, adding uh, to their vegetative state. Um, of course, when it's time to flower, which would replicate an autumn day, when they move to a flower room, they're under um, a short, I'm sorry, did I said 12 hours? I think you did 18. 18, 18 hours of, uh, of summer light, and then when they go to shorter days, 12 hours, uh, it replicates a short fall day, and that's when they're under high-pressure sodium light. So that's how you trick a plant or you convince a plant it's time to, to replicate, time to flower, time to seed. Of course, we don't do that, but mm -hmm. that's how you get uh, a plant to move into the next stage. A lot of people don't know that. That's, and that's that's very helpful. And I I, I want to okay. So you said uh, in the vegetative stage we're giving them 18 hours, yep. so they think it's some, summer. And in yep. the in the flowering stage we cut that back to 12. What about seedlings? What about you know the the picture on the bottom right there with the little clones in their in their humidity trays? What what light do those, do they need? Ian? So those those uh, at the very early stage. At any point in veg, which this would be considered veg, um, you can run anywhere from 18 to 24 hours, and that will keep the plants in the vegetative state. Um, during that process, you want to be using um, T5 or fluorescent lighting, um, as that provides the, the bluer end of the spectrum, which is what the plants need at that point of their life. Mm. Okay, that is helpful. Um, I have a question um, about seeds. If, if somebody gifts me seeds, uh, is it true that, o that healthy seeds are all really dark brown? And if, if somebody gives me some seeds that, that are kind of a lighter color, they're probably not going to be good? Or Yeah, so the best seeds are definitely dark brown. Uh, seeds that are white or light green will almost never germinate, and you will waste your time trying to germinate them. So an exercise in frustration. Yes, <laughs> Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, before we um, get into, you know, the, the sort of the teenager stage, the, the mid-veg stage, um, I do want to say that the, the picture at the bottom right uh, with the hand holding the little cutting, um, that is a plant that has developed a nice, healthy root system. And I know that one of the way, ways that patients... Uh, get plants to grow for themselves is that people will give them cuttings off of a mother plant. And, and if somebody is gifting you a cutting, uh, you want to look for a nice healthy root system like that and nice white roots um, because that's going to be a more vigorous plant. Is that correct, guys? I'm, I'm having nodding heads. Yes. yes. All right. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what we're going to need. Um, you know, obviously... Uh, when we're growing indoors, and you guys both touched on this, uh, we are sort of acting as Mother Nature, right? I mean, if we put the plants outdoors, we're going to have, you know, the actual Mother Nature taking care of some of these things. But if we're indoors, uh, we have to do some things that, that nature does on, on her own. Uh, and so there are some equipment needs. Um, and, and let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, number one, is this list, mi list missing anything? Uh, and the number two, how much are folks looking at at investing? If I wanted to grow six adult plants in my in my you know basement or in a closet in my home, how much money am I am I going to be spending? Sean, do you have thoughts on that? I am not a home grower, and I've never done it uh, at the small scale level, so I, I'm sure Ian has. <laughs> that. I actually I, I've never grown at home on a small scale. Um, I would say that this list is fairly comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Um, odor control, maybe? Yes, CO2. I mean, uh, filters. Filters. Okay. Uh, maybe some CO2 uh, sources. You, know, you can either uh, pipe in CO2 or have a CO2 burner. Of course, that's a uh, necessary input for tra plant transpiration. Um, I would just, you know, stress safety and, and being careful. CO2 in enclosed spaces can cause, you know, headaches or worse. Um, so just, and also, uh, you know, if you've got a flame source to, to create CO2, obviously be careful with any kind of uh, uh, propane gas or whatever you're going to use. Mm, mm. I, I would also add that um, perhaps some things that we could add to this list would be um, dehumidification, mm. some type of dehumidifier, depending on your space. I and mean, if you're growing in, uh, let's say... through 
dehumidification, or let's say if you're growing upstairs, uh, you may want to purchase a humidifier if it's much drier up there because um, in the vegetative state, you're, you're looking for 50 to 70 percent humidity, whereas uh, when you move into the flowering, you never want your humidity to go above 50 percent. So you really need to have control over your environment. Wow. So 50 to 70 percent humidity in veg and no higher than 50 for flowering. Correct. Yeah, because wow. as, as flowers develop um, and become more dense, there's a lot of moisture inside of those, those flowers. And um, humidity above 50 percent uh, encourages mold growth. And we don't want that. Which obviously, <laughs> the mold is, is not good for our, us growers. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Can I just jump in there? Oh, please, yeah. Um, it's very important to consider that during the lights off cycle, too. So during the dark phase, typically is when temperatures will go down and humidity goes up. Mm. So you have to have some kind of standalone dehumidification running during that lights off cycle because that's when you're at the highest risk of mold development. Right. So and mold cold, like dark, too. Cold and wet is bad. Is, okay. You want to keep it right. as uh, dry you know, close to 50% as possible right. during the lights off cycle. A little bit off topic, but, but you just made me think. Now, are there different strains that are more mold resistant? And if so, what, you know, are indicas more or sativas more? Or are there Typically, your indicas are a much um, denser flower. Okay. And uh, I would say they're more um, apt to to get some mold growth. Whereas sativas... Uh, generally speaking, are more light and airy and less prone to molding. Because there's less places on the plant where the mold can kind of get, yes. a, get a foothold. Okay. Um, I did uh, a little bit of, of investigating and, and have some experience, and I would say that in terms of prices, you can, you can get um, really good medicine, you know, growing indoors um, and spending probably 250 to to $300, I would say. Um, it's a it's a basic setup. It's not very fancy, but but you know you could start there. Now certainly you can. The sky's the limit nowadays. There's so much new technology and options and everything. Um, actually, let's talk a little bit about growing mediums. Mm -hmm. um, what do, you know? It, obviously, if I'm outdoors, I just probably put it in the soil, right? Do I need to amend it? And if I'm indoors, do I just buy a bag of potting soil? What what are our options here? Yeah. So if you're growing outdoors, you're probably going to be using soil, and you really want to amend it um, with either compost. Uh, a lot of people use bat guano, mm -hmm. worm castings. Um, those, they're going to add uh, beneficial nutrients to your soil. So things like nitrogen and phosphorus um, and worm castings will provide a lot of micronutrients. When you move indoors, uh, there's a variety of options for you to choose from. Um, some of the ones that I, I made quick note of, uh, soil, we here at WCM use cocoa, cocoa coir, um, which is just shredded um, cocoa husk, coconut husk. You can also grow in rock wool, perlite. Uh, there's a number of different ones. Those are probably some of the most common. Okay. Um, run down through them real quick. The some pros to using soil, uh, depending um, depending on what soil you purchase, it can contain uh, nutrients in it already, so that can actually make it quite easy to grow in. Mm. The cons to growing in soil um, is that it can easily get waterlogged, and if if your grow media is uh, waterlogged and too saturated, then you're not going to provide the necessary oxygen for, the, for your root zone. Okay. Uh, it's important to, to note that, uh, you know, uh, overwatered uh, root zone, you know, can lead to pythium or other root diseases or problems. Also, it can lead to weaker plants. Uh, typically, when plants are younger, and this is, goes for all plants, um, you kind of want to stress them out a little bit so that the root zone is more develops more vigor and strength. Um, the roots have to dig deeper, essentially, to, to find water. If, if they're soaking wet, they're, they're going to get lazy, and they don't need to uh, kind of bulk up and get that strength because there's so much water available. So you know, that, at different places I've worked uh, with, with produce, um, we used to bring 
the, the young plants to the brink of death just so that they would really dig deep and that root structure would become extremely strong. Um, not so much in cannabis, but uh, just something, to, it's just a point I'm trying to make about please don't overwater your plants. Mm -hmm. And the plants will thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's let's move on. Okay. So we've made the decision. We're gonna, you know, we have our our seedlings, and we've identified some some good strong ones, and we are now ready to move uh, into sort of the teenager veg stage. You're saying that seedlings are technically veg, but but they're kind of babies, and so now we're gonna we're gonna grow these these uh, plants up. So. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how do you select a strong candidate plant and and why do we need to do veg? Why, uh, couldn't you just put a ton of little babies into flower and and skip that kind of long, <laughs> that long teenager stage? Ian, you got thoughts on this? Yeah, you, you absolutely could put, it, you can put any size plant you want into veg. You could have a ton of, you could throw um, clones as soon as they're rooted, you could throw them into veg. You mean into flower or? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yes. Um, the the purpose of the veg is it's the main growing stage. It's where they reach their um, their full growth potential and size, and it's it's up to the grower to determine what size plant they actually want to go into their flower room. Um, obviously, the longer you veg, the bigger your plants will get, and typically, the bigger your plants are, the bigger your yields will be. Mm -hmm. So it but it really depends on if you're growing in a tent or in a small room. Uh, you are going to be limited on how big you can let your plants get um, to keep them far enough away from the light so that the light isn't causing damage to your plants. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions popping up, and before we get too far ahead, I, I want to come back and cover some of these. Uh, we have a question, where is the best and or easiest place to purchase seeds? Oh, my. Uh -huh. <laughs> you guys want me to tackle it? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the policy gal. Uh, and does my medical card allow me to purchase them on the Internet? Um, so here in Maine, while the plant is legal for medical patients and possessing it and using it is legal, there is nothing or no legal protections for obtaining seeds. Um, actually, the, when they were writing our, our regulations and, and laws, they, they called that the original sin. It's just like magically this, this stork flies over and, and sprinkles you with beautiful cannabis seeds and, and it's magic. Now, there are, and point two, it is a federal crime to transport any part of the cannabis plant across state lines. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you go to Colorado where they do sell seeds in their dispensaries, uh, it's, it's a federal crime to bring those back here. Uh, some of us may have seen on, on the internet that there are places that will sell seeds. Um, and you will notice that they all say that they are selling them for novelty or collector purposes only. Um, and you know, we, we, that, that's about all we can say about that. I mean, those, those places are out there, and, and, you know, I've personally heard from folks who, you know, have, have ordered those, and then they just never come. Somehow that package just doesn't quite make it through customs. Uh, so it is, it's, it's tricky. Um, you know, if you know another patient who's growing their own plants and who happens to be breeding, or maybe they have a plant that goes from Aphrodite and, and gets some seeds, and we'll talk about that you know, a little bit later, but um, that is legal uh, as long as no, nothing of value changes hands. Um, you know, somebody can certainly gift you some seeds, uh, but it does seem like clones or taking cuttings off of a mother plant is, is pretty much the safest way to get genetics here in Maine. So I hope that was, that was helpful, although not probably the answer folks want to hear. Um, <laughs> but uh, we got to work on those federal laws. So uh, we also have a question. What would that $300 be spent on in a mostly soil grow? Uh, lights? Yes, it would be spent on lights. Uh, also odor control, which is something we didn't touch on. But if you're living in an apartment, certainly if you are in a home that, you know, is, is not some distance away from your neighbors, uh, these plants are going to start being fragrant in, in the veg stage, right guys? I mean... Late veg, early flower. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some odor uh, associated with the veg stage. Um, typically, you're not going to have an odor problem until roughly week three of flower when they really start to put on 
of flour weight. Okay, and at that point, you you want to be ready for that, and and yes. so those carbon filters can be uh, expensive. Um, also, airflow. If you're growing in, uh, say, a small room or a closet, again, you want you want the air to be moving, so you're going to want to invest in a in fans. Yeah, so fans, uh, portable dehumidifiers. Right. Humidifiers. Yeah. Again, like I said before. Yeah. So um, that three hundred dollars goes quick. You may not have the proper, uh, you know, electrical capacity to to run those lights. It's a safety issue too, so just make sure that you know you read uh, the amperage and the, the wattage, and the, you have the correct electrical supply to power what you got running. Mm -hmm. You don't and want to overload your circuits and potentially cause fire hazards. Absolutely not. That looks bad on all of us. Uh, I have actually heard recently from a landlord who called because he discovered that one of his tenants had modified a room in the basement to be a grow. Um, and had installed all this electrical stuff, and, and he wondered what his legal rights were as a landlord. You know, he said, I don't have a problem with medical marijuana, but I do have a problem with this guy not asking me first. I probably would have said yes and could have pointed him at, you know, an electrician to help him with the work. So you want to you wanna do things on the up and up. It's, it's legal for us to have this and, and you know, um, and in everybody's best interest to do it safely. So, Also, real quickly, another good use of... Um, your money it would be to line your room with reflective material so that mm. you can get the most use uh, of your light that you that you've put in your room. up the light that does help thank you uh, we have another question what is the best ratio in the soil for peat compost vermiculite and these guys are kind of looking at each other because those are not those aren't uh, uh, substrates that we use right no that, here we are we're strictly using um, the cocoa, as I said before, and we mix it with perlite. And depending on the strain, uh, depending on the water uptake of the strain, we mix it. Most plants get a 60-40 mix of 60% cocoa, 40% perlite. Uh, some of the strains that um, have a, m a more difficult time draining and a slower uptake of water, we actually flip that and we'll do 60% perlite and 40% cocoa. Mm. I'm not personally familiar with Pete. Okay. And it's heavier some, though, right? Yeah, and some of the other. You know, I would say that um, there are some really good um, hydroponic gardening shops around, and and um, you know we're not going to do an ad for any one of them, but but I have discovered that the folks at those places are are really knowledgeable um, and and very helpful uh, about this sort of thing. There's also different grades of cocoa as well. You know, some of them are really fine and really uh, full of moisture. Uh, some are, are more coarse, and so you could do different grades of, of cocoa mix to get the proper drainage and uh, aeration of for the root zone. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, and one last question before we move on. Uh, if you are just growing one plant, will the odor still be overwhelming? And I think that probably depends on the size of your home, you know, if are you I mean, in an if apartment. You've a, if you've got a 10-foot plant and it's got, you know, 100 buds on it or something, it can smell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... It also depends on the uh, the ventilation in your room as well, and and where you are moving that that air to. Mm. If you, if you have a carbon filter in there, it's it's going to be scrubbing the air and removing some of that odor or most of the odor. Um, if you are directly venting to the outside, that will also remove the odor from your grow space and your apartment or, or home wherever you're growing. Uh, so it really depends on on your specific environment. Okay. So. But yeah, they can be pretty pretty fragrant. Little girls, can't they? <laughs> All right. Um, so seedlings into veg. We are we are transplanting. Uh, we're moving into this sort of teenage stage, and I'm not able to move through my PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> um, I, I hope everybody is enjoying the beautiful pictures of the pretty plants. Uh, <laughs> and actually, uh, these are shots of our cultivation facility. So. Um, so let's, you know, talk to us a little bit. What are we going to need to do to prepare, you know, before I take my, my seedlings and put them into, you know, larger pots, what, what am I going to need to prepare my space? How much room am I going to need to leave if I'm, if I'm, you know, aiming to end up with six plants flowering? Uh, talk, to, talk to us about those things, Ian. Okay, this will be a, a common theme. Um, but to prepare, the number one thing, you need to clean and sanitize your space. A, a clean grow environment is going to give you the best chance at having 
good, clean, safe medicine. Um, there's lots of products out there. Easiest to find, probably, and most readily, readily available is bleach. And I, you know, clean all surfaces um, before moving into your, your grow space. Um, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I would also say that uh, for how much space is required for six plants, it really depends on the size of plants that you want to grow. Uh, it depends how long you veg those plants for. As we talked about before, the longer you veg a plant, the, the larger it will be. So if, if, you wanted, if you have a very small space, you will want to veg for a shorter amount of time. Um, the most important thing for spacing is to make sure that you leave. I, mean, I, I like four square feet per plant. Mm. Um, that's pretty much proper spacing so that you're not providing a place for if you do have pests. If you have your plants all push right up against each other and uh, you're giving those pests a perfect opportunity to jump from plant to plant to making plant. Making a highway for them. Yes, you're okay. making a highway for them. And, and you will quickly run into some serious problems. There's a couple of different strategies, too, as far as uh, our level of production. Um, you know, we can do less plants and have a lower plant density and uh, have larger plants to get a certain uh, targeted yields. Or we can have more plants... Uh, at a smaller size to equal that same target uh, production level. So, um, and, but like you said, depending on the time of the year, you don't want to crowd plants in, especially uh, during colder times uh, or in the winter. Um, they, they can, uh, that'll transmit disease uh, much more quickly. Uh, you want to leave that, uh, that pathway for, you know, airflow and air circulation. Because below the, the leaf zone there, there's uh, little microclimates that are created that, uh, you know, can uh, definitely be breeding ground for pests. Or so um, time of year is another uh, factor in, uh, in your plant density. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I, you, you said four by four uh, feet for, you know, per plant, and I would think that that also, I mean, it's not like you're going to throw these plants in a closet and, and come back four weeks later and magically have medicine, right? You, you need to be giving personal attention to these plants. So I would assume that part of that four by four space is to, is to allow you to get in and, and look at them, right? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really okay. important to, I mean, I would put personally never take a two week vacation as we talked about before <laughs> and completely just walk away from the plants um, without having uh, someone that I know and I trust go in and, and keep eyes on the plants. It's, it's really important um, to, to spot deficiencies, to spot any pest problems um, early on so that you can identify them, take care of them quickly before they get out of control. Okay. That's, that's, and we're going to talk um, about what some of those pests, uh, you know, might, might be. Uh, we have a question. Any recommendation for automatic watering systems for a small home grow? Any experience with blue mat systems? I don't have any experience with blue mat in particular. Um, here at WCM, we have constructed some of our own um, small setups with automatic drip irrigation. Oh. Um, I, that's the method that I prefer. It's actually quite easy to set up. Um, you could go to a local um, garden store, and they can probably point you in the right direction. So you'd need like a, a reservoir? You'd need... Timers. Reservoirs, timers, and then just irrigation, like that black yep. Yep, tubing yep. stuff, yep. right? The irrigation lines, and then uh, the spaghetti drip lines that come off of those, with <laughs> we call angled arrow drippers, or um, they have uh, drip rings as well. Oh wow! Okay. So again, I mean, I, that's a that, that would make your workload easier, but it ups the amount the that you, the cost. So and people also, have to. Uh, it's been my experience that plants respond better to smaller, more frequent feedings uh, throughout the day. So mm. just like human beings, they don't want one big gulp of, of water all at once. Uh, so like three to four feedings per day to equal the same target amount of uh, irrigation water, but uh, just at, at smaller in, uh, amounts at uh, more frequent intervals. So like, you know, nine in the morning, noontime, three in the afternoon, uh, to equal, you know, three quarters of a gallon per day per plant, something like that. And is that what you would recommend? Three quarters of a gallon per plant per day? 
depending on yeah, the size those. and the stage of, of growth. Yes. Okay. Is it is it pretty much like a house plant where you can stick your finger into the the soil or whatever you know you're using, and if it's dry an inch down, you need to water? Yeah, that's that's actually a really good method. Um, you want the surface of your your grow media to dry out somewhat. Um, you you want to yeah, you can stick a finger in there, just kind of brush some of the the media off to the side, and see how far down you have to go to reach the moisture. Um, another another way that I initially learned was just actually grabbing each pot and picking it up <laughs> and, and, and become familiar with uh, how much moisture is in that pot um, just by, by feel. That's awesome. Another consideration, too, is you don't want to water too late in the day before the lights go out. I mentioned earlier um, that uh, you don't want a lot of moisture in your room uh, when the, in the lights out stage. So, uh, you know, don't water just before you put the plants to bed, basically, because it'll be too wet in the room, especially in the flower stage. Okay. And if we're outdoors, I guess, you know, again, Mother Nature is going to take care of some of that with rain and stuff. Yeah. But you, you still need to keep an eye on them, right? If they're, if they're drooping, it means they're, they're thirsty, yeah? yeah. Yes. So, and same thing, don't water last thing before sundown. And yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. I've heard of the sea of green technique. Do you guys use that? Are you familiar with it? What can you tell me about it? Uh, we don't actually employ that here um, necessarily. But, yeah, Sea of Green is basically a large quantity of smaller plants. Okay. So, um, and you, you do pack them in very densely. Um, sea of Green is, is basically just that. A lot of plants in a small, small area where you veg them for a shorter amount of time, typically a two- to three-week veg versus, um, you know, four to six weeks, which is, I would say, typical. Mm. Um, so... Sure, and the pros for a sea of green is that, I mean, although you may get a smaller yield per plant, most of the time you'll end up getting more yield per square foot. Ah. And you'll also get more frequent harvest because if you're, if you're growing all in one space and you're only vegging for two weeks, then you are starting flower much sooner, which means you'll harvest sooner and you can start the process all over again. Uh -huh. um, the cons is that sea of green is a lot of work. There are more plants, so there's more... Uh, cloning, there's more repotting, and also with sea green, you are training your plants so, so that you are forcing them through your trellis netting or whatever you're using for supports. Um, the trellis netting is the most commonly used, and it's it requires a lot of work. The first um, as as they go through veg and the first couple of weeks of flowers, they continue to grow. You need to actually take each plant and force it through the trellis netting to, to train them to exactly where you want them to fill out that canopy as much as possible. Uh, um, so a little bit like bonsai with cannabis. Yes. <laughs> the, the other downside to Sea of Green, though, is here in Maine we're limited to um, flowering six plants at a time. If you're going to veg for only two weeks, you're going to have much smaller plants. So if you're trying to get the most out of each plant, you'll want to veg for a longer period of time. So Sea of Green may not work out best for you if, if you're trying to get a large yield out of each plant. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about gender. <laughs> uh, this is something that, you know, if, if we're starting from seeds, certainly, um, you know, somebody gives you a seed, you don't know if it's going to be a male or a female. And cannabis is a species that has both male and female plants. Um, the, it, it, talk to me a little bit about this. I mean, I guess if you're breeding, having a male plant in there is not a problem. But can we can we talk a little bit about about sexing plants and what to, what happens if I see a little pre-flower like that one on the right, and boy, that looks like it's going to turn into a male. And right. it, so yeah, <laughs> obviously the reason you don't want males in your, in your grow rooms is because we don't want seeds in, the, in a flower medicine. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's important that we identify those and eliminate them as quickly as possible. And that's why another reason why it's so important to get in the crop, to be in the crop, so that you uh, can be a, you know, a, attentive to, to the needs of your plants. Um, and we do scouting you know, on a continual basis, not only for pests and disease, but also for the appearance of hermaphrodites. And I'll let Ian talk about more how that happens. Okay. Yeah, I would say that um, in the veg stage, you start seeing the pre-flowers, 
um, which you see on the, in the, the picture on the left there, you start to see those white um, pistols start to emerge. Um, that is a sign of a female, and that, that's the pre-flower. And when do I start seeing that? You start to see that roughly uh, weeks three to six of okay. veg. Okay. Um, and that, that's usually roughly the same time that you'll be able to spot your um, male pre-flowers as well. And gotcha. as, as Sean said, you, you never want those getting into your flower room because your, your male plants are going to pollinate your female plants and uh, create seeds. So as soon as we spot a male, it's, you just immediately remove it from your grow space wow. to remove the threat. It's gone. Okay. Um, but okay, so, so let's say that I have been gifted some seeds and somebody told me that they were feminized, right? They're supposed to be all female. And I get to veg and I start seeing male pre-flowers like that or like the one in the middle, a little bit of both. What? Is that bad genetics? Is that something that I did as a grower? What's, well, what causes that? Many um, quote-unquote feminized seeds are the result of uh, pollinating female plants with pollen from a hermaphroditic plant. So, uh, and if you if you if a female plant is pollinated by a hermaphroditic plant, it is the subsequent generations are going to have the tendency to also be hermaphroditic. Okay, gotcha. And can can like environmental stresses make a plant turn like that? Yes. Too. Yes. Okay. Um, from uh, temperature, um, light. Light is light is the big one. Uh, you know, if you go into you know, somebody inadvertently flicks on the lights in your in your flower room. Uh, you know, there's a high probability that you might get some hermaphrodites. Sometimes you get lucky and it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in an outdoor grow with a, a, a thunder lightning storm, uh, lightning can turn really plants into hermaphrodites yep, if it's a That's strong enough, enough flash. Wow! Wow! Okay. Um, so something to keep an eye on starting in about week three. And if I start seeing the male pre-flowers, then I want to get rid of that plant yes. pronto. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, because basically when the, when the female gets pollinated, she stops putting out the medicine, right, and just focuses yeah. on reproduction. As, yeah, as soon as a female um, becomes pollinated, it completely stops bud and flower growth and puts all of its energy into producing more seeds. Wow, okay. But we don't want that. <laughs> All right, so let's say we've, we've successfully navigated the vegetative period, um, and, and we're going to move into flowering. Uh, if you're joining us just now, this is Becky D. with producer Ben and Sean and Ian, two of our very talented cultivation experts here at WCM, talking about growing your own medicine. So we're, we're moving into the flowering stage. How do I know it's time to put them into flowering, uh, and, and you know, what do I need to be ready for? So you want to be putting your, your plants into your grow space, and it, again, it depends on the size of your room, but you want to be putting them in um, when they're slightly smaller than your ultimate goal for what size plants you want okay. to achieve, because the, um, the first roughly two weeks of flower, your plants are going to continue to grow, and depending on how long you have veg them for and what lighting you're using and the environment that you've created, um, plants can grow an additional foot to foot and a half the first two weeks of flower. Wow. So wow. Okay, so be ready for that. Um, actually, that, uh, that, that kind of brings up a couple of, of things that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, can I do this all in one room? Can I, can I veg and then just change out the light bulbs and turn that into my flowering room, or do I need separate spaces? No, you can absolutely do that. Uh, the thing that what you can't do is veg and flower in, in the same area because... As Sean told us before, the uh, veg light cycle is 18 to 24 hours, whereas the flower light cycle is 12 hours. Okay. So if if you're trying to grow them, if you're trying to grow multiple stages in the same spot, it simply will not work. Gotcha. You can't mix stages. You just have to grow from. If you're going to do it in the same space, you have to grow it from beginning and to end and keep those same plants in that same room. Okay. In the same stage. And that way, it, the the downside to that is that you can't have a continue. It just right. it stretches out your continual exactly. harvest, right? You Correct. can't be getting ready for the next yes. flowering stage yes. while these are finishing. You have okay. To start from scratch without building up to you know, gotcha. the next subsequent generation. And while in veg, it's important to use, um, as I said before, either the T5 fluorescent bulbs or metal halide bulbs. Whereas in flower, 
um, you're going to want to use high pressure sodiums as they are on the red end of the spectrum, which induces flowering and, and fruit on fruit trees. More replicates the tall spectrum of light. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, what kind of, of nutrients, I know we don't use any over-the-counter nutrients here, right? You guys do magic with, like, essential salts and things. Um, but if I'm not a chemist and I don't know about essential salts, can I, like, put miracle Grow on my plants? Do they need different... Nutrients mm -hmm. and flowering. What's what's going on with that? You could use Miracle Grow, but I wouldn't suggest it. It's it's um it's a very concentrated um, form of nutrient. It uh, and it's not designed for cannabis. So I would personally stay away from using Miracle Grow. Okay. What was the that, that was pretty much it. And and I would say again, in the same way that we you know we're not going to do an ad for any particular hydroponic store or anything, um, you know, we're, we're not going to promote or, or suggest any specific over-the-counter, but this is another place where if you if you need guidance, the folks at those those grow stores can be very, very helpful. I would just add that um, the vegetative stage requires um, more higher, con or higher, higher concentrations of nitrogen. Okay. That is responsible for vegetative growth, whereas the flowering stage, um, phosphorus and potassium, levels get elevated because those are, are more for um, producing the flowers and, and putting on weight. Okay. All right. Um, what should I be doing when my plants are in flowering? Should I just be leaving them alone? Should I be pruning? Should I go in and cut a bunch of, like, how do I, how do I shape the plant or do I? Yeah. I mean, as when we per first put them in the flower, we do what's called a lollipop prune where we remove all the lower uh, flowering sites off the plant. We'll even remove some of the lower branches. Basically, what you're trying to do is eliminate anything off the plant that isn't going to get the proper amount of light um, that, that the plant's going to require to actually put on the, nest, or the weight that you're looking for. So by removing those flower sites, it redirects the energy towards the flower sites that remain on the plant, and in turn, those flower sites will get much larger and you'll get better yields. Gotcha. So I just want to add something to that. Yeah, Sean. Uh, Ian alluded to it earlier in the conversation. Um, cleanliness is the, uh, the biggest pre uh, preventer of pest and disease. So while you're pruning or if you're removing, you know, yellow dead leaves off the bottom of your plant, don't leave it laying around. Uh, mm. Get rid of it immediately because that just provides harborage for any pests and disease that might already be present that gives them a place to live and to grow and to thrive. So in any uh, in any growing situation, you want to stay clean. What a what a great point! And actually, we got a question um, on our Facebook page <laughs> that I, I forgot when we were talking about the earlier stages. But uh, somebody asked, uh, "How do I keep my cats from eating my cannabis plants?" And <laughs> we we don't have cats here at WCM, but um, I would I would say that you need to keep your cats or dogs out of your grow room if at all possible. You know, Is that right? Just consider anything or anyone a vector of pest and disease. You know, uh, if you've got uh, friends that also grow, and you never know, they might have thrips, they might have double spotted spider mites, they might have, you know, tobacco mosaic viruses, there's a whole litany of things that can be transferred from grow to grow. So, uh, you know, guard your, your plants. Keep people out of your plants. If they don't need to touch them, don't let them touch them. Keep, keep people out of it. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, in my experience in California, I was a, a buyer um, at the dispensary I worked at out there uh, for quite some time. We, it was a different setup. We didn't, we didn't grow any of our own medicine. We, we bought it from caregivers, and so people would bring us stuff, and we'd, in those days, evaluate it organolect uh, organoleptically, which is like with our eyes and noses and stuff. Um, and I cannot count how many folks I would have to turn away because they're their product, you know, looked beautiful but was infested with dog or cat hair. And yeah. it's just not, you know, um, not medicinal, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. And to go back and quickly touch on the, um, Becky asked what, uh, how many, how often to prune? Yes, the time of day stage. we've got a question about that too. Yeah. How, okay. What, do, should I go in with scissors? Should I pinch? Talk to us. Yeah, as uh, we typically, uh, we set it up and we, we prune at certain um weeks of flour just to fit it into our production schedule. But I would suggest if you're growing on a small scale to prune throughout the flowering stage, but do it selectively. What you want to do, I, I try to preach to the cultivation assistants to get up on a ladder if, if your plants are tall 
and do a top-down approach, look down on the plant and selectively take the larger fan leaves that are blocking light from reaching the, the inside of the plant. Um, you want to selectively take them off just to A, for better airflow, and B, for better light penetration. Wow, okay. And and do you use, you know, the Fiskars, or do you, can you just pinch like nope. you do with the... Yeah, as we... Um, when we do the lollipop prune the first week of flower and we're removing branches and lower flower sites, we do use Fiskars or, or scissors. Um, but as you're just removing fan leaves, we're just pinching them off. We, you can just snap them between your fingers and your thumb. And um, okay. yeah, just... I, I wouldn't suggest using scissors. It's going to be a more time-consuming process. Great. Thank you. And don't leave them on the floor. <laughs> All right. So when... When should I harvest? How do I know? You know, obviously they, they start making these very pretty uh, buds and, and blooms and the, the odor is getting just delicious and, and I go in there and my mouth waters, but how do I know? <laughs> how do I know when it's time to, to cut them down? So there are two methods. Um, the first method isn't, um, I, I, in my opinion, I, I wouldn't consider it um, as effective, but you can check the pistils or those white hairs that I referenced before on the buds. Mm -hmm. You'll typically want to wait till roughly 50% of the pistils have changed color. Uh, to get the most potent and THC-rich buds, harvesting when 50 to 70% of those pistils have turned orange and have started to curl, I mean, that's perfect timing. Um, if you, then again, if you're looking for a more calming and less psychoactive effect, you can harvest the plants when s roughly 70 to 90 percent of the pistils have turned orange. Um, so let them go a little bit longer. Let them, yeah, let okay. them mature a little bit more. I would say the more accurate method is using a loop or a magnifier, a jeweler's loop, mm -hmm. um, to take a really close look at your trichomes, which some people refer to as the crystals or the sugar or whatever on on the buds. If you look closely, you'll notice that the trichomes look like tiny mushrooms. Before the plant has reached maturity, the trichomes will appear glass-like and won't have much color to them. But as they reach maturity um, and it's time for harvest, the trichomes will become cloudy and will appear to be more plastic huh. and less glass-like. Okay. And 30x, that's the uh, magnification? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's really... Preference and, and okay. eyesight and uh, I mean, <laughs> the older uh, you get, the higher <laughs> magnification you might need. <laughs> some people here even prefer uh, a 10x. Oh really? Okay. So yeah, it, it really depends on preference. Okay, awesome. So my trichomes are turning a lovely amber shade, most of them, uh, and it's time to cut them down. So let's talk about what we're going to need. You know, I, I know I know Sean is going to say something about cleanliness. Um, <laughs> how do I prepare for a harvest, and what should I expect as we're going through it? First off, you have to have a place to dry them, right? So you're going to make sure that your dry room or your dry area is ready to accept your harvest. If you've got no place to put it, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay. So that uh, then you have to have a method to you know cut the plants down. We use uh, loppers. Mm -hmm. Depending on the size of your plant, you can use scissors or loppers. Uh, we cut the the plant right at the base of the root ball, um, and then uh, we, like you said, we keep things clean. We uh, keep our tools and equipment to clean with acetone. Uh, you can use uh, alcohol as well, about 70%. Okay. Um, and then do uh, you want to talk a little bit more about what, how you harvest? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would just like to add as well that you're going to want to prepare that room just like your grow room with environmental controls. Um, you're going to want to control your temperature and humidity. Ah. 70 degrees and 45 to 50% is perfect. Okay. And uh, also airflow. You're going to want to make sure that you have an oscillating fan in there of some kind uh, to keep the air moving. What you don't want to do, though, is uh, let that fan point directly at any plants because it's going to force them to dry much quicker than they should. Uh -huh. And you'll end up with a, a smoke that is much more harsh. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, also, you want to make sure that your dry room is completely dark um, as light does degrade THC. So okay. It'll also uh, bleach the, uh, the bud and the flower, uh, you know, give it a, a lighter color than, than, you, than you're shooting for. Huh. Also, as soon as you harvest, uh, don't forget about your grow space. After, you know, you, people kind of hang their plants up and then say, oh, my grow space is done with for now. Immediately clean it for your next harvest. Mm. Get it ready 
so uh, you know you don't have any nasty things laying around uh, in that space that are growing and incubating. So um, as soon as you cut your plants down, get everything out of there, clean the space, and get it ready for the next the next stop. Very good advice. I'm um, I'm looking at these. Uh, you know, I've got two pictures here of plants hanging, and obviously they have they have cut little branches off, and they're hanging them. And then there's this net-like thing uh, that they're laying them on. Do, do you guys have a preference for that? Should I should I hang the plant? Should I? I I would suggest hanging uh, either a whole the whole plant itself, wow. or um, possibly cutting the plant in half and, and hanging it that way. It's again, it's up to personal preference. A lot of people do cut off individual um, branches, mm -hmm. and if you're growing on a small scale, that may actually be beneficial for you, but what's going to happen is uh, your your medicine is going to dry much quicker. And ah. like I said before, a nice, slow, even dry is what you're looking for. You, I know people get um, anxious and, <laughs> and they're, they're ready to have their final product, right. but you're going to have a better final product if you take it slow and let it dry properly. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that uh, you know, if you dry it too quickly, it almost has a, a heavy taste or, or smell almost mm -hmm. like a hay field so okay so we want to we will, but we're getting into curing actually i think a little bit too you know so we we dry and and when when the stem what bends snaps how do i know when it's ready to start curing i would say uh it has finished drying and it's ready to, to start the curing process when those branches do snap when you put some pressure on them uh if if the stems still bend, it still has some drying. There's still moisture in it, and you want to get, get that out because that will yes. do all sorts of, well, it'll affect the flavor, and it'll also affect the potential for mold or mildew buildup. Okay. Yes. Um, final trim and curing, uh, time-consuming, yes, um, but worth it. What, why do we, uh, you know, I, I have the picture on the, on the, screen here at the, at the top right of the Tupperwares, and then I know some folks use mason jars. Um, talk to us about curing. It's, it's similar to, you know, just like tobacco curing. It, uh, it locks in, you know, the flavors and the smells. Uh, it pretty much, you know, solidifies your product or your end result so that, uh, you know, you're preserving that uh, the flavors and tastes that you're that you spent all that time to achieve. So <laughs> uh, definitely a, a necessary step. Uh, you don't want to rush it, like you said. You might get anxious and then want to uh, use your medicine, but uh, you know you got to take that time to to make sure that it's it's a top quality product. Yeah, it's essential if you want the best tasting and smoothest smoke. Gotcha. And the curing process should be a minimum of one week, um, but anything over three weeks, I don't believe is necessary. Oh wow. Okay. And and we're just putting it in something that's airtight and then burping it twice a day. Is that and and in a dark space, right? Yes. Okay. Keep it in a, a dark space. Again, uh, temperature and humidity controlled. I would suggest filling your tote or your jar roughly two-thirds of the way, leaving space at the top of your container so that when you flip or turn uh, the medicine, which is basically just taking the jar or the tote and turning it upside down several times to get the, the medicine in, in your container to, to flip. Um, gotcha. Also, um, yeah, at least once a day you'll want to what we call burp, your container, where you're just opening that lid or unscrewing the lid, taking it off, allowing for gas exchange, and then recapping, putting the lid back on. Is it, can it be that fast? I, yeah. I take it off and yeah. I just... Yeah, because if you don't, there is uh, there is some risk of like decomposing starting to happen and get slimy and yeah. you know, flat on one side. And you, know, and you can that smell thing. when that's going yeah. going down, too. So, um, Gentlemen, I am, I am sensitive to, to your valuable time, and we do have a couple of tips on pests and everything. I'm wondering if you would allow Producer Ben and I to come back maybe in another month and talk a little bit more about pest control specifically as its own... As its own topic, with that, yes, I'm getting, I'm getting nodding, yeah. and absolutely, okay, awesome. Um, Ian, could you give us one more time the the humidity and temperature ranges for the drying and curing processes? Uh, for the drying and curing processes, I would maintain roughly 70 degrees. I mean, 68 to 72, roughly, um, and a humidity below 50 percent. Okay. So I would say 45 percent is the magic number. Magical. 
Right. Whether you need a, a dehumidifier, it sounds like a dehumidifier might be, that's where you definitely might need one there. Yes. Okay. All right. All right, folks, I am not seeing any further questions in our chat box. Does anybody have any last-minute questions? I'm not seeing anybody, and I don't want to cut anyone off if they type as, as slowly as I sometimes do. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So thank you again for uh, joining us, and, and we hope this has been helpful. This has been Cultivation 102 with Sean A. Bear and Ian Andrews, two of our uh, cultivation masters here at WCM, and we will see you next month, gentlemen, again for a little talk on pests and, and problems that can go wrong and how to fix them. How's that sound? That's great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.